So, uh, you guys will be familiar, uh, at least with the background of that image and what I'm going to be talking about today, which is uh, the development of one particular Zooniverse project called sciencegossip.org. I don't know why my title has changed, but it's shrunk a little bit. Many are better than one when hard work is to be done. And I want to explain why that, as a sentence, is a great way of thinking about the relationship between history, doing history in the 19th century, and doing citizen science as a 21st century practice. So I'm a historian of science. I came to being a postdoc on the Constructing Scientific Communities Project three years ago without any knowledge of doing digital stuff, um, data analytics or citizen science more generally. I was a complete neophyte to it, um, which I think in some senses helped me um, interact with the project, the platform, and the community in a way that, that was um, mutually beneficial. Um, so through this presentation, I want to I think a little bit um, more than we have uh, earlier on today about what it means to be doing digital, um, digital humanities and uh, digital citizen humanities instead of citizen science. Is there a critical difference between science and humanities and, and using platforms like Zooniverse.org? So I'm going to talk about this project we developed in collaboration between three different big supergroups. The Constructing Scientific Communities on the left, the funding body that gave me a job in the first place to come and work with Zooniverse. Uh, Zooniverse itself as the platform for making the project, and the Biodiversity Heritage Library, which was actually um, the group that the, the, the place where the data came from to create citizen, the sciencegossip.org, um, and essentially were the drivers behind um, the, the questions and what they wanted to get out of the, the project and the website. It's been running for a little while now. It's been running for <coughs> two and two years and a couple of months, um, and it's been pretty successful um, in terms of doing a history project, incredibly successful if I was just a historian, right? Um, we've had 550,000 classifications uh, by just over, or just under 9,500 users. Um, this has meant that we've classified uh, something like 155,000 pages of periodicals of the 19th century, uh, from 19th century natural history. The basic concept of the website, of sciencegossip.org, was that I, as a historian, have a bunch of periodicals that actually sit here in this museum. Uh, has anyone had a chance to go over to Library and Archives here? Uh, if you haven't, go over now, afterwards, go over to Library and Archives, because this museum has loads of really wonderful things. It has fossils, it has bugs, it has books, and that, this is what I want this presentation to remind you of. Um, that books are an essential part of citizen science, citizen humanities, uh, but also this museum here, right? So as a researcher, I came in and realized that there's just, it's one of the best places for studying 19th century natural history, obviously, but it's also one of the best places for studying the periodicals that came out of the 19th century because the museum itself collected a whole range of newspaper, journal articles, books to do with natural history to do with a whole range of practices of natural history, and they still sit in the museum, much more so than they do necessarily in the British Library or other big super muse uh, museums and library groups, because they collected for specialist specific reasons. So actually working in the, the Natural History Museum, working with Zooniverse, and working with the Biodiversity Heritage Library, which itself is a super group of super libraries of natural history, created the, the potential for me to do good and valuable and different types of history through these periodicals and through its interaction on a citizen science platform. So what I came to the museum and realized there's just loads of periodicals. I already knew that, that um, periodicals in the 19th century were a boom period. This is when we have a massive influx and um, increase in periodical literature, especially for natural history, which is one of the dominant 19th century sciences and that there's just loads and loads of periodicals to study. And that was what I was hired to do. I was hired to figure out what images meant for these 19th century natural history periodicals. There's tens of thousands of titles alone, or maybe tens of hundreds of titles alone. There's tens of thousands of, of 19th century journals, natural history itself, there's hundreds or thousands of titles that I could study that could give me important, valuable history to do with um, collecting practices, to do with entomology, to do with geology, to do with botany, to do with all of these, these different practices, and to do with the people, the individuals, mostly invisible, that were creating um, and informing 19th century natural history practice. And that in order to do that effectively, I needed to work um, with the crowd. I needed to bring in uh, the tools of citizen science to understanding these 
large data sets. And the development of sciencegossip.org actually um, helps inform that research, changed what I could do with that research, certainly the scope of it. But at, at the end of the presentation, I, I want to get to the point that it, it's actually changed the practices that I invoke as a historian myself. So it changes the very mode through which I understand and do history. Uh, it's changed the way that I think about what history should and can be. Um, and how to interact with a group of different in individuals to make that actually possible. And maybe, hopefully, down the line, this might actually change the way that humanities starts to work together, starts to work as a, as a discipline in itself. What have we actually looked at on Science Gossip Over? So um, we have looked, we have gone through 18 individual periodicals, um, and importantly, these range across a number of different kind of uh, disciplines within natural history itself. So we have The Geologist, which was um, an important geological magazine in the 19th century, obviously. We have the Quackett Microscopical Club, which we have some of the members here today, one of the longest lasting um, natural um, uh, microscopical amateur communities uh, in the world. We have their journal, we studied that. Um, we looked at botany, and we looked at uh, kind of large genre natural history journals. Um, the, the, the title of the website actually came from my favorite uh, 19th century journal, Hardwick's Science Gossip, which was actually a periodical that um, saw itself as encompassing all types of natural history, from random antiquarian objects to important evolutionary discoveries. Right? Um, so we, we have finished 18 of those periodicals, and if you go onto the website right now, um, you, can have, you can find four current journals that are still waiting to be classified uh, to different levels of classification scales. So we have um, the Quarterly Journal of the Geological Society of London, as well as a journal of botany of Britain and British and Foreign is just two examples. Please go on it. <laughs> Come experience what citizen humanities is. Um, so you saw uh, Grant this morning uh, make science gossip in three minutes. It took a little bit longer than three minutes to actually develop uh, sciencegossip.org. I'm, I'm going I'm to admit this out loud. Um, but I think it's important to go through, um, again, uh, what tasks um, you as a user or any user would uh, is a are asked to do when they come to the website in order to tease out um, some of these questions we've been talking about throughout the day. What are, um, how do we frame our communities? How do we frame the kind of questions that we ask in order to most effectively bring forward uh, community participation but also get answers out that we want um, to, to find valuable for history? So the, the very first thing that anyone is asked to do is define whether or not there's an image on the page, right? Um, and if there is, then you say yes, and you move on to the next task. If there isn't, um, then you say no, and, and the, this, um, the, it then gets eliminated to a certain degree from, from the um, classifications that you're asked to do. And I'm, I'm going to come back to this a little bit later. Um, what is the point of having that as an as a actual task for people to do? Whether or not we can use a computer to, to eliminate all of those blanks or non-images in the first place, Actually, it was a, an important question at the very start of, um, of our beta testing and of the creation of science gossip itself. The next task um, starts uh, to increase the level of participation required in order to continue on. So you have to draw your box around the image. Um, if actually on this page you wouldn't have to draw a box because the whole page is an image essentially, right? There's a lot of pages where it's a lot of text and just bits of images. We also want people to draw a number of different boxes, because there's, importantly for me, there's loads of different types of images on these pages. Some are lithographs, some are photographs, um, some are engravings, some are something completely different. Um, and we want them to draw all of these different types of images so that we can then correlate, and I as a historian can understand the diversity of images on all sorts of different types of, of 19th century periodicals. Once they have drawn um, the image, this is actually the key um, task for Biodiversity Heritage Library. When they came to us, what they wanted most critically is, were two things. To know where the images were on their database, um, because they couldn't OCR that, they couldn't do optical character recognition to figure out where the images were, but they also wanted to add um, critical uh, species metadata into those images. So this task is um, important for me as a historian to a certain degree, but much more important for the Biodiversity Heritage Library. And I think that's actually one of the, the key points that I've learned, is that in order to make one of these projects successful, it needs to have, um, at least for the humanities, it needs to have multiple different values coming from different, um, both the sciences, library, um, consortiums, and scientists together to get out different forms of information on this. It's not just 
the, uh, the CSV files that I'll get at the end that I can make into an argument about history, it's that um, a big library, a big online library like the BHL can also get something out of it. And if I fail completely of getting anything historical out of this, there's still the value for the BHL, um, which I think makes the time and put into this in the first place um, perfectly valuable. So they add species data on each of these images, um, both their common name and their scientific name. And what's actually really interesting about this is a number of these illustrations have none of this information on this actual page. Um, and the users themselves have to be detectives to find where this information is. And I think, for, as a historian coming to this, the assumption is, well, why, why would anyone do that? Um, if people don't have that necessarily have that knowledge, so there's going to be a failure. We're not going to be able to succeed in that. But what we found is that, that that's absolutely not the case, partially because of the structure of the website. Um, there's a number of different ways in which you can actually go to the source material here. And I think the assumption is that people won't read, but they definitely will, right? So they go back to the BHL where this, all this information sits, um, and they scroll through the pages of the periodical. And I think also importantly that uh, each of these periodicals, these images that they get that they're asked to classify, are then brought back to their actual historical context, the page which they exist in the original periodical, and they scroll, can scroll up and down and see what the context are. Or they can go to Google and just do a broad search for what this image might be. A lot, what we're finding is a lot of people are doing a lot of deeper historical research to figure out um, a whole range of species labels, as well as um, the context for the people involved in writing this. We've created, um, as all those universe projects have, have, have a, a set of, of kind of help um, aspects to them, describing um, what uh, illustration um, uh, tags are, so a lot of people won't be uh, comfortable with the Latin um, terms for del ad nat, which means um, d designed from nature, which is essentially drawn. Um, sculpt usually means it's an engraving. So all of these things um, need to be in some um, beautiful way. Actually, I think it, the, the aesthetics of this is an important uh, aspect of, of the project, but also in a clear and kind of concise way of describing what these things are, that giving the people the tools to do this. And, and in a second, we'll, we'll talk about talk as an as a equally important part of this. So the last thing um, people are asked to do is to add keywords, um, which is important again for BHL, but then finally, do they want to talk about this image? And again, this is a, a, a universal of those universe projects that they're then brought to a community site that they can then um, engage with what's going on in this image. They can engage with um, anything to do with the image, right? They can, they can say, well, this has to do with um, uh, spiders, or this has to do with uh, a wolf spider, and they can create hashtags, and they can start associating things together. I can ask them to create hashtags, so I can say, I'm really interested in a particular engraver from the 19th century. If you find something to do with George W. Ruffel, can you create a hashtag and start associating, uh, start associating images together for that? But they can also then do that for anything they're interested with. So most of the hashtags have actually been driven by the users themselves. Um, I've, I've asked for maybe two or three hashtags. Everything else has come from the users themselves, uh, which I think is another critically important part. So we've talked a fair bit about talk or the community function of, of Zooniverse, um, but I think uh, and, uh, maybe we can talk about this at the end. For a historian, actually, this is equally, if not more important than any of the data that's going to come out of the actual um, sciencegossip.org you know, uh, metadata that's going to come out of it. Because this is um, a, a place for me to understand the contexts of people participating in, that, in 21st century science and 21st century history. That is precisely the same kind of questions I'm trying to ask about the 19th century. I'm trying to ask what is going on with, the, why, do, why are people motivated to participate in uh, observing natural history in the Victorian period? Why do they want to write and draw for periodicals? So the questions about modern citizen science users um, make uh, a direct corollary to the historical questions that I'm asking. So talk actually becomes not just a site for research, but a place to reflect upon the historical research that I'm doing and to create new forms of, of reflection between those two places. Um, and I think actually we've already pointed out to this that, that talk is a place where serendipity and where, for, where control is completely outside of your hands. Right? So, and that's the most fascinating part of it for me, because there's things like this image um, is from the Quackett Journal and has to do with a, um, 
a, a wolf spider, but what, what the uh, users found was that what was most interesting about this is not what's in the image, but by who made the image, and that it was one of the it was a female illustrator, and that what was most fascinating was to, to, starting to describe all of the female illustrators and participants that they found in their participation on the whole website, on the whole of Science Gossip, and all of the periodicals that it, they've been participating with. So they took this and they, they created it, their own discussion um, about, well, who are all of the female contributors we've come across? Can we create a, a master list of this? Um, and we're, we're in discussion about um, possibly bringing that to Wikipedia and creating better Wikipedia entries for all of these invisible people in the production of 19th century natural history. So it's, it's taking history into the hands of the users much more directly, at least for me, than, than I, I do in my own research. I, the hand, the, the, my research is in my own hands and essentially never gets publicly uh, interacted with. Here, <laughs> I mean, a couple people read it. I, I, I had a book out last year. I don't know if anyone's read it. Here, <laughs> you know, nine and a half thousand people have at least come onto the website and are, are taking the research in their own direction. I think that's, that's the most brilliant aspect of citizen science to me. The last couple of, of minutes I want to talk about um, where this, uh, so some of the problems of, uh, of, of absence in, in these projects, um, and then what it means for me doing history. So there's two problems that, that at least we've come up across. One, that, as I pointed out, um, when we were developing the project, the question of blanks, or what do we do with non-images, was actually at the core of it, right? So we actually, in the first two weeks of our beta testing, we had one of our users say, well, I've actually created an algorithm that can wipe out all of your blank pages. Do you want to just use that? Um, and we thought about it, we talked about that for quite a while, and then just ultimately decided not to do that, because what we wanted people to do was to, um, to come across all of the context of a 19th century journal, to be able to see that there is a lot of blank pages, there's a lot of non-images, and that actually, if we had done that, we would have never come across this page, which essentially would have been a blank page, a non-textual page, but there's great and important historical information about 19th century citizen science practice itself. So talking about, this is a journal called the Wiltshire Natural History Journal, um, and they're talking, the, the person writing for this journal was talking about the very practice of natural history, and he says, it is, in a word, that of effecting, by the cooperation of many, a task which you will not easily find one person fit to undertake alone. Not that such a task is beyond the strength of one person, if he had life before him, and certainly of health and encouragement. The undescribed part, of, I really want to see the undescribed part of Wiltshire, is not, <laughs> is not so frightfully large, but it needs no oracle to tell you that many are better than one when hard work is to be done. And if we had eliminated this, you wouldn't have got this great discussion on talk, but also this is a, a, an essential historical example um, and proof of citizen science in the 19th century um, of discussing the very contexts of doing natural history, but also the context of doing citizen science in the 20th, 21st, and the 19th century. So finally, to the point of well, what does this matter, or how does this change um, how I understand history and how I understand the practices, the interrelationship between citizen science and history. So this is kind of the output of what Science Gossip's metadata gives me. I can go onto uh, one of the, the web pages and interact with the page, each page like this. Um, which gives me great information about um, how boxes were drawn, where, where tags were given, loads and loads of metadata. I can download it into um, a file, a CSV file, that, that has all of this um, broad and deep information about 19th century natural history. To, I want, part of the point I want to make is, to me, this is actually very hard to deal with, because I'm, I'm a historian not trained to deal with this kind of information, right? This is how I'm trained to deal with information, right? I sit with a book in front of me. Sometimes I make Excel sheets because I want to know about how things happen over time, but they're, they're much different than this kind of Excel sheet, right? So part of, I think, the problem and issue of doing this within the humanities is, um, whereas it might not universally be true that in the sciences you have um, broad uh, quantitative and analytical tools to deal with this, in the humanities you almost never do, right? We don't have that infrastructure there to support learning in that. And that in order to effectively do citizen science and humanities in the future, I think we need to integrate some of the skills that come from the sciences back into the very practices of history. But without losing the side of history, without losing the, the investigation into the actual volumes sitting in front of you in a desk 
in the Library and Archives and the Natural History Museum, that in order to do good history and in order to do good participatory history, you need to do both of these things together. You need to have researchers with specific expertise sitting in front of these objects that can then bring that knowledge to the platform and help the platform bring new knowledge to them. That the reciprocity between information um, needs to be an essential part of the construction of both the knowledge of, of citizen science but also the knowledge of history itself. And that's what I want to end on. Thank you.